Hi, everybody, and thank you, John. I was, um, got a good blast out of that. Um, I feel like my name's really Tony Jones, and I've changed my position, and I really support mining now. Um, I'd like, in our studio this evening, we have um, a beautiful panel of uh, great, great folks, actually. We, we have um, we prepared uh, our conversation earlier to, to distill these questions for you a little. Um, if I could just um, introduce, uh, in order from the, the far end, Jake Klein, CEO of Evolution Mining. Clyte Danga, who is the General Manager stake of Stakeholder Engagement at a CRC for optimising resource extraction. So that's mineral extraction breakthroughs. Um, obviously a, a, a interesting place to work. Samantha Ware, Human Resource Advisor from the Gruyere Joint Venture, which is a Gold Road uh, Resources Project. And Anthony Kirk, who's the General Manager, Iron Ore Projects, Fortescue Metals Group, not a small role. <laughs> That's 99% uh, of their business or somewhere around there. Um, so please welcome the panel. Um, thank you. We, um, we're going to, uh, first I'm going to ask them to uh, launch each of them into something that, that we've either spoken about or they feel about that, that is interest. Uh, of interest to us all in uh, the boom-bust cycle. Now, as we, we thought about um, the boom-bust cycle and, and how we can, what we can do about it, um, a couple of things really came, Jake made a very good point, which is there's an economic boom-bust cycle, there's a commodity boom-bust cycle, then there's a project cycle as well. And the thing that we really felt <laughs> Each of those, you could sort of open a conversation now and run for a fortnight, you know. So there's a heap of stuff to talk about. But most of those cycles are out of the control of the operator. So what is in the control, what is firmly in the hands of the operator and um, is uh, the, the people factor. And, and so we, we're going to focus a fair bit around uh, people, um, about... Um, so, so what I'll do is just run through the, the, the panel and ask uh, the four to uh, give a position. I'll also give one because um, uh, might as well. <laughs> Don't get, get off too lightly standing here. Um, so if I could start with Jake. If um, you're all wired up, you're all ready to go, you should be firing. Um, Jake, from the conversations we've had before this, um, what are your thoughts about... Uh, overcoming the boom-bust boom cycle and some of the key points that we discussed together already. Thanks, Julian. And is this working? Morning, everyone. Um, I guess to start off on a somewhat somber note, I'd say, um, yeah, if you're nervous about the mining industry and the future of the mining in industry, I think it's a good sentiment to start this conversation because I'm a big believer in what Andy Gro Grove, Grove said, uh, the founder of Intel, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> and I think there's, there's reason to be a bit paranoid. Um, and it comes down to people uh, and how do we attract and retain the best people to our industry. Um, I think I circulated to you, Julian, a, a, a survey that um, of a thousand young Australians aged 15 to 18, these are Australians, um, and 60% of them did not think or know about mining as a career. And 40% of those people did not know that mining was required uh, for a solar panel, an iPhone, um, or, a, or a battery. Just, just repeat that, Jake. That's really, this, this is astonishing figure. 60% Six, did not think of um, mining as a career or did not know anything about mining as a career. And 40%, it was a solar panel, an iPhone, and a battery, I think. Did not know that mining was required for that. So that's, <laughs> that's the context in which we face. 40% of the cost in our business, I presume it's the same with uh, fellow panelists, is, is um, employee costs. Uh, and so, you know, for, for, I, I hear everything that John had to say about automation, and I agree with all of that. 
But the reality is people is at the center of our business. Uh, and likewise, if you, if you take it one step further, uh, you know, how do we attract and retain the best people? We've got to make it an attractive career, but we've also get a, got to get a much more balanced conversation happening in the mainstream media. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail later, but that, those are my opening comments, Jimmy. Thanks a lot, Jake. Um, Clytie, would you like to um, hold forth? Yes, well, I, I think I certainly share those sentiments and perhaps being in a research, uh, collaborative research centre, I'm actually anxious about the research minds and people actually being interested in coming into mining from a research perspective. And I think also in research, there does tend to be an ignorance on what the key issues are in the mining industry. And perhaps as an industry, we haven't done a good enough job in actually enunciating the big challenges that research can help with. And there's probably a little bit of vice versa. You know, research hasn't um, properly explained some of the opportunities. But I think there's continuing opportunity for greater integration between research and the industry to provide that collective solution to some of the challenges we're, we're facing. And I think, you know, it's a real opportunity right now as we move into potentially a, a, a a healthier environment. There's so much um, success now in the digital space that will allow us to actually, instead of throwing more equipment at, at um, our mining operations, there's a real opportunity to take advantage of things that are happening in, in the research space and particularly in the digital space. That whole concept of being able to simulate, optimise and test things in a virtual reality before you actually go and apply it at a mine site. That's a, that, we've got the tools now to do that in increasing um, precision. And I think that's the space where we need to be working with people of different backgrounds to traditionally those that have been attracted to mining and really take advantage of the knowledge and the skill set there to be able to, to do some of that work. Great. Thank you, Clyde. Um Sam, what are your, um, what would you, what have you selected out of our conversation that you'd like to put out there? Sure. Um, for me, in order for us to continue seeing success and growth in mining, we need a steady pipeline of talent coming through. At the moment, and from what Jake has said as well, we have limited interest from young people. So for me, I think we need to see more involvement at the school level, as young as early high school, if not earlier, to really gain that interest. Yeah, and I, I think we have 25, across Australia right now this year, we have 25 mining engineering students enrolled right across the country, which is, I mean, 250 would not be enough. So it's, uh, it, we're at a crisis point. So, um, and um, Anthony, you get called a Tony, do you, I suppose? No, or Anthony. Anthony, Anthony, Anthony yes. are you? Yeah, it's very good. Thank you. Um, now, you'll have, um, you won't be short of a, um, a view or two on being West Australian. Are you, are you West Australian? So I'm West Australian and I've spent 25 years of my career in the iron ore industry in the Pilbara. So uh, I've right. seen well, a reasonable back, amount of everybody. variation. Love to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I've seen a lot of variation in our industry and uh, it's just a fact of life with the industry we work in and, and increasingly so, you know, as our reliance on China has grown and, uh, you know, the market's driven by government policy and environmental policy as much as it's driven by market demand. So really, uh, you get a lot of dislocations, um, which companies just need to build resilience to um, and, and focus on what you can control, which is basically your safety, production and costs. Dis sorry, dislocation. As in, you know, changes, you'd think the market's going one direction and the Chinese government introduces an environmental policy and shuts down half the steel mills. Or, or a ban on coal, Im ban coal, on, coal imports uh, as we, soft bans, whatever it banned, is. Soft bans. <laughs> so you, you get very rapid swings in demand. Um, so I think, um, you know, for us, really having a company that can withstand those swings is, is critical. And for Fortescue, it's actually all about culture and the values on which um, our culture is built. Um, you know, and when we talk about values, their values are really entrenched in our business and, and some of those that I think are very important in this sort of um, response to cyclic 
demand is, is frugality. So frugality is spend the least amount of money on the right thing. Um, the other thing we're very focused on you know, is, is um, getting people to generate ideas, empowering people to generate ideas. And you run a theme of um, don't pull out the checkbook. There's a whole lot of different ways to solve problems. And those values are actually critical in the boom because where people uh, get into trouble in cycles is, um, is when they spend too much. And if you want a va an organisation that's cultural based, then it's all about your people. And what you do with your people, how you train your people, develop your people, attract your people, um, builds the culture, builds those values. And uh, that's what allows you to, um, to cope with the different uh, cycles uh, that will attract people, makes the industry more attractive. Um, so to me, you know, for, for us, it, it is about people and it's about developing the right cultural and values. So you can see we've all landed in, in a similar area because, because we just think whatever, the, whatever the you can do starts with people. And so that's where we're going to be um, tossing it around a little further. We, we will take some questions uh, in a while. Um, Anthony, with the um, one thing always fascinates me, of course, with the with the mighty Twiggy in, 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 as your chairman and founder, um, where you have a single person, there's a single reference. You're not looking. The, the employees don't look to a committee. There's a there's an absolute power in in knowing what. I mean, you can read about what Andrew thinks just about everywhere. Um, any comments, I suppose, you've, you've worked elsewhere in the iron ore industry. What is it that makes, that makes that having this individual... I've seen the same thing happens at Roy Hill, by the way, too. There's this sort of very, you know, working for a, for a single purpose for a single person comes through a lot. Have you got any, um, anything you'd like to chuck us on that? So, so I'll go back to the values, because values are very much those developed by Andrew right from the inception. Um, and he really, truly believes in those. I mean, we've just been doing you know, some, some reinforcing of those through the organisation. And, and Andrew himself has been involved in articulating to the business exactly what the values mean to him. Um, and you know, they, they really underpin the business. The, the other key thing you know, with, um, with Fortescue, I mean, Andrew still walks in and out of the office. It's an open plan office. And then the next level down, you know, you need to make a decision. You just walk up and go and walk up to the CEO and ask her. If she needs to check with Andrew, she'll pick up the phone and ring Andrew. And you make a decision. So the company is very, very responsive, very reactive. But I do think that that close connection with Andrew has really maintained the values in the business. Yeah, that, isn't that interesting, Jake? Because Jake also um, is a uh, has been a long time uh, man at the helm of a of a company that he's built from um, a, a struggler in the back blocks of China with huge cultural problems to uh, the mighty evolution today, which is uh, on a terrific growth path. Um, maybe uh, I mean it's a bit. You're actually the key figure in that company, so you're going to be very modest about it, knowing you, Jake. But um, what what efficiency? What is there that personalises that makes things matter through being, um, you know, not a like a lot of companies. You don't even know your next division. You know, you're sort of you you're, hot, you're in in between managers, and this sort of soullessness. I think dilutes a lot of purpose, but the strength of you guys who ultimately feed the project pipeline, mm. um, what do you think about the, this sort of personal value stuff? Or, or uh, It's very easy to fall into motherhood, but what's it like and why do you think you succeed? I'm not sure I should be the person on answering that question, but I'll have a go because probably some of our people who are around here at this conference should be chatting. Oh, they might be shareholders, you reckon? Yeah, no, not shareholders, but in, uh, <laughs> people who are involved in it. But I think what we, 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 what we really want to do for every person at, at Evolution is engage and empower people to be able to be in control of their, uh, their job. Um, you know, whatever it is. So there's that famous story of JFK touring the uh, NASA uh, sites uh, in 1965, first, first mission to the moon, and he met the janitor and, the janitor, and he asked the janitor, what are you doing? And he said, oh, 
I'm helping put a man on the moon. And if, you know, if we can do, empower our people at Evolution and at every one of the companies at this conference uh, to really feel like they're making a difference, uh, then you're going to have a successful company. And they all could stop you in the hallway and, have a, and question you? Yeah, absolutely. Drop in. Uh, you know, I, I send out a weekly blog to all our people. I hope some of them read it. Uh, but some of them do because I get some feedback. Uh, you know, we, we, we ultimately want to make every person at Evolution's time at the company a highlight of their career. You know, whether they move mm -hmm. on at the end of the day and, and they, um, uh, they go and find something else to do because we haven't been able to give them the next opportunity. But if we can challenge them to be the best they can, uh, then you're going to have a great workforce and a great company. Yeah, and the well, other thing, sorry, Julian, is yeah. you know, the one consistent thematic that I've observed over the 25 years I've been in the industry um, is that people want to feel empowered and that they can make a difference. The one thing you see and you observe about companies uh, that started small and grew uh, and then have, have failed uh, have been that ultimately people say, well, you know, systems overwhelmed us. We used to be a great company where we could, you know, Andrew Forrest was accessible uh, and Fortescue still is a great company. But there's a point in other companies' evolution where, um, you know, that doesn't happen and systems start to overwhelm people. You know, we bought a mine from Barrick. I don't think Barrick would mind saying that they grew too big. Uh, the people at, at, at the cow mine are still the same people who work for Barrick but they are making a huge difference and feeling much better about working for Evolution than they did at Barrick at that time of Barrick's um, mm. t tenure. And it meant you got it at the right price too, so that's important. Well, people said we overpaid, <laughs> but that's proven to be wrong. Uh, Sam, uh, I, know, I know you have some, some strong views too about um, what uh, Gold Road did and uh, in terms of, so what we, again, just to remind you, we're working around the boom bust cycle things we can control, where, where the most power is to, to buffer and survive and thrive through the boom-bust cycle. And we've all sort of gravitated towards the, the human dimension. Sam, your comments about uh, Gold Road. Sure, I think focusing on the culture um, from an HR perspective, it's really important that your organisational culture transforms and grows with the organisational strategy. So of course we've seen massive change in terms of our organizational strategy at Gold Road with the discovery of Gruyere and with our continued exploration initiatives. However, at the same time, we had to grow. So we've had huge cultural transformations, um, last year being quite a significant one. So at the end of 2017, our employee turnover rate was 25%, which was very high and it was definitely something we were not proud of as a business and specifically in the HR space. By the end of 2018, it was at 6%. So we retained 94% of our employees across the year of 2018 at a point where exploration was booming and there were opportunities across multiple companies for our people to go to. And that came down to culture. So we changed what, our culture. What, just, just to <clears throat> boil it, chunk it down, what, what were two, say, two really important things you did to, to bring that about? So I suppose we differ in the sense that we started at the board and executive level and we discussed the culture across the entire organization. So everyone contributed to the change. Everyone shared their story, their own Gold Road story and what it meant to them. Um, from there, we took initiatives like we implemented flexible work arrangements, but really flexible. So our corporate staff, they'll work from home, they'll work the hours that suit them. We trust our staff, so we enable them to do that. Wow. Um, and we changed our fly and fly out rosters as well. So we went from 14 days on, seven days off, to eight days on, six days off. And through that, we were able to retain our top talent and to continue growing the business. Mm. And uh, I noticed in exploration too, there's quite a lot of um, uh, women coming into that sector. There are exploration camps out there that are 50% male, female, which uh, makes me wonder why it didn't happen to me about 20 or 30 years ago. But, <laughs> Um, the, uh, it certainly, uh, it's certainly, a, it's a very promising development and one of the, one of the things that always concerns me is that, you know, women have traditionally either or tended to not be recognised for their merit and the point I will also raise is that men have also traditionally not been recognised for their merit as in, in mining companies and uh, I think that's one of the great points to make too because if you can talk about merit rather than quotas, 
although we filled the quota on the bench here today, that was very clever of us. <laughs> no joking, but um, we, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, that divide is, um, is uh, something that we hope, you know, we've got the worst record. I mean, you know that, well, I guess we all know that um, about employing women, but that's another area where, where I think it rounds out the workforce. Um, uh, Clytie, would, would you like to um, maybe talk a little bit around the culture? I mean, a CRC is a funny old place, isn't it? It's a, it, I mean, do you, you're owned by, you've got so many masters, haven't you? What? Yes, well, I mean, I think probably CRC is unique, but perhaps if I draw on some of my yeah, previous please. experience, I think culture is very critical and it's easily damaged, uh, particularly we were talking about boom and bust here and certainly in the bust periods, I, I really like the, the, the sentiment that Jake talks about that it's more, more about people than process, but it's very tempting in the down cycle to, you have to make difficult decisions and companies have overreacted and got rid of a lot of people and that does great damage to culture and it's very, very hard to build it up and be trusted again, you know, when you, when you do that on, in cycles. Um, can, I, can I just come back? I, I can see uh, Anthony nodding away there. You, you had a bit of a crisis, what, four or five years ago, I recall, where, where you had to, um, uh, correct me where, where I'm wrong here, but you had to stand down a bunch of people and then I think you might have got them, a lot of them back again, didn't you? So, I mean, we've been through a few ups and downs in Fortescue, probably 2010 in the global economic crisis, um, we probably made the same mistakes as everybody else um, and, and stood a lot of people down. You know, I think through, through the more recent times, um, we've been a lot more... Um, pragmatic about how we've approached it. So 2010, it was just, just a whole lot of redundancies. Yep. Um, we grew too big. We didn't think it was changing and you know, had to make a decision at last minute. Actually, Jake, you made the point now, I'll come back to you, um, Glidy, but Jake, you made the point about how a lot of companies are so beholden to, to the market forces that if you don't have something to say in your quarterly about how you're addressing a matter or if profitability slides, and I, I know that the market was ready to savage Fortescue, it, you know, the, the, the long knives were out. And uh, so, so really the market's there saying, don't make a loss slash people. And um, uh, yeah, that was uh, you know, certainly some, you know, you, Jake sort of suffers it on the, on the burning mm. nose of this issue, don't you? Yeah, to... I mean, we're, a, we're an industry that reports every quarter and yet we have this yeah. incredible capacity to surprise people all the time. Um, you know, most, most industries only report every six months, and yet the volatility in our sector is extreme. So either we're not informing investors sufficiently well, uh, or we're, they're not listening, uh, but there is definitely an issue with respect to uh, investors, uh, analysts, understanding the, uh, the, the, good, the fortune of the company. So you talk about boom-bust cycles, you know, Exploration companies are really R&D, and, and that's what they should be recognised as. Mm. Uh, there's going to be high volatility, uh, high risk, high return, mm. uh, but the, you know, the number of high returns is going to be relatively low. They're going to be great when you get them. But we need to pitch it as R&D of our industry. Um, you know, why um, companies uh, that are uh, producers and um, you know, we've got ourselves into over leverage, we've got ourselves the volatility, we're in a very cyclical space. So you know, at 1850 Australian dollars today, the gold price is fantastic, but in 2015 it was $1,500 an ounce. And we do have uh, a cognitive bias to believing the gold price is going to keep going up or our commodity that we're producing is going to go up. Mm. And we tend to run our businesses like that. So we need to get better at that. And I, I just want to come back to Kind of, I, 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 I've been talking about culture, we've all been talking about culture, but fundamentally there are some significant strategic issues confronting our industry that we need to face. Uh, you know, I have two young adult children. Uh, they were certainly in the 60% the of people who did not think of mining as a career at all. Uh, generally, you'd have to say mainstream media, you're in Sydney, would be talking about mining being pollutive, uh, environmentally damaging, unsafe. Where are we pitching mining uh, as an industry that is actually quite, has a very small environmental footprint, 
uh, is not a bunch of climate change deniers uh, and is safer than the manufacturing industry. When are we going to start getting on the front foot with regard to having a much more balanced conversation uh, with the population? Mm. Thank you. Clyde, would you... Um I did cut you off to take this one, but... No, on, just on sort of continuing that conversation. It's sort of... Um, do you think there's a sense that it's someone else's job to organise this message that we're purveying? I, I, I sort of think there's an inertia of people are waiting for someone to take the lead and, you know, plan out how we should be communicating with the, the public. But I think it's really... It's both an industry, a company, and an individual's responsibility to change the perspective of mining. I mean, just a little example. We have seven um, undergraduate mining vacation students in at CRC over the holidays. Not one of them was a mining engineer. They were IT, chemical engineers. Um, I think we had a mathematician. They knew nothing about mining, and in fact, you know, they, they just sort of put up their hands for a, vaca a paid employment role. But when they got in, we had the opportunity to get them working on really interesting mini projects that they could actually deliver something within their... We were looking for their IT yeah. programming skills. At the same time, we were able to be in their ear saying, have you considered mining? You know, this is a great industry. Look at the international career I've had. Mm. You know, why don't you think about this as a, as a future place to work? And I think it's early days, but we, some of them are now applying actively for grad positions in mining companies, which they wouldn't have thought about before. And I know that's increasing, increasingly the way we... Um, I don't know how many of you know the Unearthed series where they go out and uh, throw a problem into a room and they bring in students from all walks and there's a bounty. Whoever solves the problem the best, they do a pitch at the end to say, and I know uh, uh, Jake uh, has, uh, has been, his company has been a strong supporter of this, but they give the, they throw it open. There'll be this many people and there's all these, and they come, they're mathematicians, they're all kinds of folks that come in to solve a problem that the company has the courage enough to say, listen, we, we're completely stuffed by this. Uh, the, the, the Newcrest had a problem with its ball, massive ball mill, uh, sag mill. Um, every now and again, it would just overcharge itself and, and cover the mill floor with feed, and no one could really see it coming. They showed them that the data was... They were so didn't, exasperated that they threw it open. But the great thing is that we did recruit outside of mining, and increasingly we're getting these people coming in. So um, these unearthed uh, uh, campaigns have been very good. We, we're having a great time on this. Um, I might just um, be fair, and uh, if there's uh, a burning question or two down there on the floor, I'd love to hear from you. So you might have to uh, wave uh, vigorously in the dark here, or there's, there's one down here when, when the mic's ready. Um, yeah, so the, um, uh, I'd like to say um, there's not many people in the mining industry who who um, really want to be critical of the three big companies. I know Andrew has been. <laughs> um, CRA, BHP and Glencore, and I know we've got at least one of those companies in the room here today. <laughs> what I would say is that, that they have been doing the, the least for, for um, promoting the image. They have the, the biggest shoulders and, in my view, should be doing the heaviest lifting in that respect. Uh, and, and showing the leadership in everything, in, in acceptance of technology, uh, diversity of employment, but most of all, in improving the image of our industry in schools and, and creating and changing the messaging, for God's sake. You know, we're all sick of this sort of stuff in the newspaper where, you know, and, and Glencore announced that... Um, hi, Glencore, wherever you were. <laughs> Glencore announced that it was going to cap the coal... Uh, it's coal production. Well, that's kind of smart because it seemed like a market play to me. But, um, you know, certainly we can, you know, we, we all, and I love the fact that there's a self-reliance, particularly with Sam and Clyde about saying, me, I will change it. And I certainly know I do my bit. Um, the, um, uh, but also to turn it around and say, look, it's not a comfortable position being in a major, major mining company. Um, you have to change this. We as an industry expect you to put not the small number of millions that goes towards the New South Wales Minerals Chamber, we expect you to be spending hundreds of millions worldwide 
to change the image of the industry because that's the sort of horsepower we need. And if you're, doing, if you're accounting for 60% of the world's mineral production, well, how about doing 100, you know, twice, you know, you've got the people, the depth, the skills, um, stop being so comfortable and get out and, and face the challenge that, because all of these smaller companies are feeders. They're mergers and acquisitions. They're all feeders into the big companies. But uh, that's my piece. I'd love your question. Have we got that mic on down here? Hello. There we are. Thanks, Julian. Um, <clears throat> Deirdre from BHP. <laughs> <laughs> My question's actually more for Samantha, who touched on the fact that we probably need to be doing more at the school level. So I'd be interested in hearing what a couple of initiatives you think um, could be um, quite easily done by every mining company, which then, as a collective, could potentially make that difference because we certainly are seeing the lack of, of a talent pipeline. Sure. I suppose it's a question for all of you. When is the last time that you were in a classroom and you spoke about your resource career? Do you have children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren? Have you gone in and done a science lab? It's, it's pretty straightforward. I think that's one of the aspects. Again, it's changing the conversation to be positive to talking about the positives of fly and fly out and the many career opportunities uh, that we Let have. me just clarify, your challenge to everyone here is to go and find a classroom and give one lecture in it. Is that, is oh, that a good start? It's a couple hours a year, definitely. A couple of years, there you go. All right, so <laughs> you're all empowered now and we'll, we can re report back next year. There's another question I, coming up there. Oh, I interrupted. I was just going to expand. Um, at, the at the WA Mining Club as well, we've actually partnered with STEM United. Um, so STEM United is a program which will be implemented very soon. We are going, well, STEM United will be going into year nine schools within WA and actually taking science lessons with them. So we're talking drones, robotics, and just trying to gain that interest. So that's likely to reach between 3,000 and 6,000 students, and that's one single program. Just, okay. just before you, you go to the next question, I mean, I, I think that comment is, is so valid and important, and, and the 25 mining engineers currently enrolled. That should be ringing alarm bells ar around this, this audience in government. I mean, how important is the resource industry to Australia's future mm. prosperity? It's been very important to our past. It's going to be as important to the future. And you know, whether we've got to be getting you know, more data scientists, more technology, but we've got to be making mining and, and a career in mining as attractive as being at Google or Facebook or any software company. And people have tried to, I mean, governments have offered, I don't think you could turn up and, be a, and put your hand up to be a mining engineer and immediately get a scholarship, couldn't you? But that doesn't seem to be turning the dial, so it's got to be more than just offering scholarships, it's got to be... And maybe it is that earlier, inter, yeah. earlier interface uh, with people when they're starting to formulate their career aspirations. Would you like to crack, Anthony? No, I think we should... All right, we are, we're, we're, yep. we're having too much fun here. Question, no. please. <laughs> Glencore, thank you. Uh, Janine Goodsman from the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, Glencore are going to be working with me. We're going to get an underground mine site that's inactive in the Sydney Basin and use it for underground habitat, preparing for space. I have the use of a Mars rover. And as you may know, the Mars, Mars rover on Mars just collapsed trying to excavate, so we need some excavation technology. <laughs> um, and we will be building bases on the moon to fly to Mars. Virgin Galactic are going to build a spaceport here in Sydney. So um, Glencore is doing its bit. Um, so I just thought oh, I'd good. correct your statement. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think you're going to get them off that easily. I'm on their case. <laughs> All of the big three. Hi. Yeah, um, um, we, uh, hello? Yeah, yep. it's okay. Hi, I'm Melinda Hodkowitz from the University of Western Australia. So I have a class of 350 engineers that I lecture on a weekly basis, um, and they're about to graduate a depressingly small number of them would have had vacation work in the mining industry. And I put everybody here on notice about that. Every one of you companies and the OEMs should be taking students because the messaging is, we've known about the mining engineering crisis um, for years. The 25 mining engineers don't sit up there and say it's a surprise, mm. really. Um, that's kind of shameful. Um, the, the second point I want to make is that, I'm glad you mentioned unearthed. Um, me and my students have won four unearthed prizes. Um, and when I look and see um, what those students have gone on and done, um, many of them have indeed 
uh, being tempted, uh, attracted to mining companies. So unearthed is definitely proving successful. These are people who uh, wouldn't have considered it. Um, but when they get there, these are very, very digitally savvy individuals. They get there and they work for people who are not. Mm. Mm. Yep. Think, think about that for a minute. If you want, they go to Google and Amazon and stuff because they want to work with people who understand digital technologies, who can teach them. So what are the people in this room doing to upskill themselves so that they can, these, these bright young things can come in and not go back to using archaic technologies like Excel, All right. which really... I'll take so that this is my question I'll for the I'll take panel. that as a question. Would you want to have a crack, Anthony? Yeah, I'll have a... Are you getting off lightly <laughs> here on me? <laughs> crack at that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I would hope, um, you know, there would be uh, more digital savvy um, people in, in our business. Um, yeah, given we're um, you know, a long way through just com converting the whole of our truck fleet to autonomous and really within six months um, we'll be the only fully autonomous um, open pit mining operation as opposed to underground. Um, and you know, with that, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of roles in that business associated with running autonomy. In fact, you know, I'd say our, our biggest problem is getting enough people in to support that. Um, we, have, we have been on the vacation students and, and graduates, um, you know, we have had our ups and downs, um, but uh, we've seen a lot more focus on that at the moment and, and basically a, any graduate that's interested in mining that's walking in the door at the moment is getting a job and we, we are running sort of, you know, much more around the sort of 30, 40 VAC students, but I, I'll accept your criticism, the past hasn't been great in that space. All right. Too much fun being had. We're going to have to choose between these questions. Microphone is with that one. I think that might have to be there last, otherwise I'll get fired from here. <laughs> Thank you, Gillian. Uh, Joe Cronin, Resolute. Uh, boom and bust. So I guess as a mining technologist who's been around for a while, what frustrates me beyond belief is there is no vision of what a mine looks like in 10 years' time. And who owns that? Is it the CRCs? Is it the mining companies? Is it the OEM? And the boom-bust cycle is, in my simple opinion, when the bust comes, we should be investing in the technology that we can take into the next boom to maximise the profits. When the boom comes, we're too busy. When the bust comes, we sack all of our R&D people. And you want people to come into the industry. What the mine looks like in the future is not a bunch of mining students. They're going to be uh, IT students, they're going to be AI students, there's going to be mining skills, there'll be all sorts of engineering. Mm. And we can't bring people into these industries because we don't have a long-term vision of what a mine looks like in a decade. Therefore, if we don't have the vision, we can't sell the vision. We don't know who we need to recruit. recruit. And I think as an industry, it stuns me because of the turnovers, the turnovers, the cost of investment in mining. We just don't look towards the future. And you know, we should be looking and saying, this is our vision in 10 years. Regardless of what happens, we will continue to invest and share that vision. We just don't do it. Great point. Um, I just want to, so I should have brought it actually. I saw a, a graph uh, just the other day that showed um, the number of ounces of gold that you need to buy a Sydney house with, the average Sydney house with. I don't, did you see that graph, Jake? Yeah, I did. It, um, it's kind of the same now as it was 40 years ago. You need the same number of ounces of gold. So I guess there's, uh, that, there's some proof that in the end, um, the world wakes up, needs the commodity, and, and in the end things, there is a level of stability. Uh, and uh, I think, that, but the takeaway from, from today, I think, uh, uh, well, why don't I um, just uh, run along with a fabulous panel. I, I feel like we could go all day on this. It's uh, very interesting and some good, really great questions. That, um, you want to um, just have a little um, a shot to conclude, each of you, or you're, um, anyone bursting to say some more? Uh, why don't we, Anthony, why don't you? Yeah, I do want to actually respond to the last um, speaker. And yep. I think, uh, I think it's not necessary that companies don't have a vision and, and certainly you know, we're working uh, extremely closely with Caterpillar on what a mine looks like in 10 years. 
I think the biggest problem with the mining companies is they don't work together and don't share that information. So there's a lot of work out there. We just don't share it with anybody. Mm. I suppose my key takeaways from this is what I've already gone on about. Basically, I would love to see everyone become more involved with students and for us to contribute not just on a collective company level, but as individuals as well. Um, just following up on, on um, Anthony's point, I think vision setting is one thing. I, I, I actually think that, and I don't wish to just be a promoter of CRCs, but CRCs and schemes like the CRC is a good way for companies to actually coordinate and cooperate without investing all their own money in one single project. They, they so, don't squabble with each other? Or, no? Well, yes, but you know they've all signed up understanding that it's a cooperative effort. Mm -hmm. And you can leverage federal funding as well. But I think not just CRCs, but similar setups where companies can actually come together and collaborate, maybe get some federal funding and actually try to map out some of those future challenges together works really well. And then you've got to overlay that with the challenge of its implementation. Once you've developed something new or, or had the vision, how do you actually go and implement it? I'll Quick one, Jane. Yeah, I, I mean, just from the questions and the comments from the floor and the, 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 the panel, uh, I mean, this is a conversation that needs to be had now. Mm. Uh, it needs to involve government, it needs mm. to involve universities, it needs to involve the participants in the industry. Mm. And, and we need to have a mature conversation about how we're going to bring our industry into the 21st century and make it really attractive for all stakeholders. Mm. I, I, um, uh, I, I just want to finish on a, a, a personal and positive note that today, in, on my own part, as a geologist, I've managed to breed two mining engineers. <laughs> And uh, the eldest is today actually doing his medical to start work with uh, Jake's company for four years. So uh, <laughs> done my bit. Um, look, ladies and gentlemen, this is a huge amount of fun. As Jake says, we, we, could, we could really settle in and do this for a whole day or, or a week. Um, and uh, but, uh, maybe, look, all-star panel here, would you please join with me and bang your hands together.